Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Brian Pavovar, senior scientist at NREL. He will be discussing current federal research on renewable fuels, uh, hydrogen, and technology spotlight, uh, H2 and scale initiative. Uh, Dr. Pavovar, whenever you're ready, please take it away. Thank you. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to get to talk to you about uh, some of the work we're doing in hydrogen. Um, the uh, I'm going to talk first about hydrogen at scale, um, and there's some other information that are on these websites um, that are listed here. Uh, hydrogen at scale has been a major initiative within the Department of Energy um, trying to show how hydrogen works in very specific ways within the energy system, and I'll get to that moving forward. But what I always like to start with is um, basically some of the motivation for this. Uh, this is a picture taken from the office, the, the, the building that I sit at in NREL, uh, overlooking Denver, um, showing basically a lot of the air quality concerns that uh, are, are prevalent uh, today, uh, all pretty much driven by uh, transportation emissions. Uh, there's signs on the highway um, every day this week and last week that basically uh, give ozone alerts and ask for carpooling and using public transportation. There's an issue with um, the environment and there's an issue with power generation. Uh, fitting hydrogen into this part of the discussion is very interesting because of the way it acts cross-sectorally uh, and can do things like bridge uh, wind and solar with transportation sectors, and I'll get into that in the next couple of slides. Um, so when we look at our energy system, there's actually a challenge for its sustainability, and what society is going to require is, is that we do things like transportation, that we run industry, we run the grid, um, and even if we had a completely uh, CO2 emitting free grid, we'd still only get less than half of our old CO2 reductions because over half of them come from industrial and transportation sectors. When you talk about decarbonizing the energy system, there's really limited options. Uh, renewables is one of them. There's also nuclear. Um, it comes with waste and other kinds of issues um, permitting. And then there's also carbon capture and sequestration, but Capturing and sequestering the carbon takes a lot of the energy uh, out of the process and doing things like um, coal-fired power plants, you'd actually have to burn 20 to 30 percent more coal just to be able to sequester the CO2 back out. So when you talk about these different options, um, they're all potential viability of how you do the power generation. But then for the end use, there's really only two different options. One is intensive electrification, and battery-powered vehicles are doing this, and I think you'll see more and more electrification within other areas. But there's a limit to electrification um, in both the time frame that it can be used on and the energy density of electrification and storing energy as electrons. So that brings you to carbon-neutral fuels. Uh, we talked about biofuels. Um, pretty extensively in bioproducts as even a competition for those. Um, Hydrogen is another potential carbon neutral fuel or part of the pathway to a carbon neutral fuel. So one of the major things that has changed in the last decade or so uh, is highlighted on this graph, which I've taken from Aruma Junder, who used uh, DOE wind and solar reports to basically come up with contract prices for wind and solar. Uh, over the last decade or so to show how much the cost of wind and the cost of solar have dropped. And how that's, when that's happened, you can also see that the capacity factor for these have gone way up. So the fact that we're putting more and more of this on because it's becoming so cost um, competitive is a good thing. However, the wind and the sun have limitations in that they're often variable and intermittent. And so sometimes when you get this energy, you have more of it than you can use, and sometimes when you want it, it's not there. So you can talk about what that means in a overall energy system, and I'm going to show another graph here, which I've taken from uh, Ben Krapowski, who's the um, Energy Systems Integration uh, Center Director here at NREL. And it, in, in this part of the animation, you can actually see what exists today in terms of percent of variable renewable energy on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, the size of the energy system. So something like the entire continuous United States has only got 5% of its energy from variable renewable sources, um, but it's a very large energy system. Other things like an Alaskan village, 
uh, have almost all of its energy being supplied by variable renewable energy, but it's quite small. And there's almost a straight line that goes through these. Uh, the interesting pieces on here are things like Denmark, Germany, and California, which although they show up in the system this way, they're not actually islands. They actually connect to other local places, and they can use neighboring areas and export and import for some of the handling of their systems. So while they show up here, they don't have the same rules as some of the other energy systems that are shown. If we look at um, modeled systems, we can talk about what happens as we approach the future and we go to even higher renewable energy penetration rates. And these are mostly models that NREL has done looking at um, what happens when you start trying to get higher levels of wind and solar penetration on the electricity grid. And, what you've, and there's been DOE goals for 2050 of where you want to get to. What's interesting about this is, is that when you talk about where the U.S. is at right now and you go up to about this 20 to 25 percent level, it's fairly easy to do that because the grid has enough flexibility to accommodate um, a certain percentage of its um, generation come from, coming from these variable sources. Now, when you try to take that higher and you go up to 50 percent, it's very much harder and then if you do something like try to get to a much more decarbonized, a much cleaner system, it becomes extremely difficult. And in looking at these problems and some of the limitations of the variable um, renewable inputs, it's really led us to talk about storage and talk about hydrogen in different ways. So Eisenhower once said, if you can't solve a problem, enlarge it. And that's where I really think hydrogen comes into this. And so here I show a conceptual hydrogen at scale energy system. On the left-hand side, you can see things like wind and solar, and they usually just feed into the electricity grid. We have natural gas um, and nuclear, and usually they just feed into the electricity grid as well. However, their thermal and their chemical energy uh, can be run through uh, and made, turned into hydrogen. The electrons in the grid can be stored in batteries and brought back to, as electrons, but that's a limited application for them. With hydrogen, you can actually break out of that, and it's a clean intermediate energy carrier on par with electrons, only it has storage capacity as well as energy density. So it can be brought back to power generation, but bringing back electrons for electrons is a pretty low value proposition. It can also be used in natural gas or hydrogen infrastructures, um, but if you're gonna use it for thermal energy, it's a very low value proposition as well. What you really wanna do is you wanna take that energy that's maybe coming from the wind and the sun, and bring it all the way across to the right-hand side of this into these value-added applications of transportation and industrial use. So fuel cell vehicles are obviously one great source of hydrogen consumption. They, um, there's now 2,000 vehicles on the road. There's 27 fueling stations that are open to the public in California. And the technology's got to a point of near cost parity when projected to volume, or, or maybe cost parity when projected to volume with competing technologies. So there's an issue with getting it up to the scale of other production and how we get the hydrogen there cheaply. But the technology to do fuel cell vehicles is now something that's real world and it's out there and it's available. Uh, additionally, right now, for hydrogen, we actually have 2% of the U.S energy go through hydrogen, that's as much energy in hydrogen as there is in all the wind that we have as well, and, and several times more than what we have in solar right now. We don't usually think about it because that hydrogen usually goes into upgrading um, crude oil to um, make the energy density higher. Uh, it can also do the same thing for upgrading biomass. Um, it could also take CO2 from the air and make synthetic fuels. Uh, however, how far that is from commercial viability is still a little ways away. And wh about 1% of it goes to upgrading uh, oil, and 1% of the country's energy is uh, 5 million metric tons of hydrogen, and it goes to upgrading oil. An equivalent amount of hydrogen is added to nitrogen to make ammonia um, as uh, part of fertilizers. And so 2% of the country's energy already runs through hydrogen. The public usually doesn't think about it. We have things like 1,600 miles of hydrogen pipeline in the country. Um, we have two geological storage systems for hydrogen. Its infrastructure is much less than that of natural gas, and we use it somewhat differently. But a lot of the challenges, safety, and handling issues are very consistent with natural gas. Other things like metals refining, which are re 
responsible for 7 to 10 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions could also be done with hydrogen in much cleaner processes. And if we had hydrogen around in this way, we'd find all sorts of other use, whether they be plastics or food industry, um, that hydrogen would fit in as well. So the attributes of the system are really that it's a large-scale, clean, energy-carrying intermediate that can be used across energy sectors. It enables increased penetration of variable power and nuclear. Uh, it has expanded thermal generation possibilities through hybridization. And even in the short term, uh, cheap natural gas is a great stepping stone. Natural gas tends to be a backstop for renewables right now in their variable and intermittent nature. And it's also a cheap pathway to hydrogen uh, for the short term until we have lots of excess variable electrons around and need the most efficient way to transport them into something that's of different value, and I'll get to that in another slide or so. If we do all this, we end up with a number of benefits. The first is economic. We have increased energy sector jobs. I thought that um, Dr. Gay did a wonderful job of talking about all of the solar industry and jobs by getting increased um, solar and wind penetration. There's a lot of unoutsourceable jobs. We also have a lot of the lowest energy costs when it comes to the wind electrons that we have in this country, and that can give us a manufacturing competitiveness or at least sustained manufacturing competitiveness as well. From a security standpoint, we can reduce imports or increase exports. It gives the system flexibility and resiliency, and it can do things like enable us to do metals production because we can potentially do it cleaner, uh, which is one of the large reasons that we've lost a large global share of metals refining. And it relies on local resources, which we have in abundance as well. The economic, uh, the environmental benefits are the last one. Those usually are pretty clear. There's things like improved air and water quality, because not only do they have, does hydrogen allow you to put more renewables on, if you get rid of combustion and transportation processes and instead use things like fuel cells, you take a huge cut out of the criteria pollutants and the greenhouse gas emissions that we're talking about. But the other one that you don't often think about is, is the water system requirements. So when you start taking off the cooling towers of the large thermal generation sources, uh, approximately 40% of all energy, 40% uh, of all water consumption in the country is due to energy-related applications. And when you start taking out some of these large thermal sources that use large cooling towers and ponds, what happens is, is that you actually get a lot of water back. Because even though hydrogen that we're talking about would come from water potentially, the water to run a house and your vehicles is equivalent to about one toilet flush of water each for the amount of water on a daily basis you need for the energy for your house and another one for what you need to run your vehicle. And the last piece of this is, is that when you get all of these benefits in a single energy system, the values are much more than just additive because you're basically taking on all of the problems at once in a way that other solutions can't take on in the same way. So uh, within the National Lab System, um, and there's been a large team, and you'll get to see some of the participants in it, um, we've talked about what we need to do this. And really what happens is, is that we have to get to cheaper um, hydrogen generation um, from water splitting. We talk about how we would do this at a low temperature and how we would do this at a high temperature. There's different types of challenges for that, um, but there hasn't been all, a lot of research or focus put on this. Um, Things like hydrogen storage and distribution. Um, how do you make a hydrogen infrastructure that could perhaps parallel what we have for the natural gas infrastructure? How would you do large-scale hydrogen energy storage in the most economic way and in the most advantageous way? And then things like hydrogen utilization, which is how do you do things like metal refining or other industry with hydrogen? Uh, we've made lots of progress in transportation uh, using fuel cell vehicles. Um, I'd love to spend more time talking about how far they've come. But once you have hydrogen, it's kind of a ubiquitous um, analog to electrons on the grid, you'll find all sorts of other applications for it. Um, and when I talk about hydrogen, it's not always hydrogen for hydrogen's sake. Oftentimes it's just an intermediate um, being the best route to chemical bonds that then carry energy for other applications. Within these you know, four pillars, we also have cross-cutting areas of analysis, foundational science, and ties to the future electric grid that are also important and hydrogen has an impact on. 
I want to talk real briefly here about the economics of renewable hydrogen. The, the attributes and the positive aspects of hydrogen have always existed. However, some of the specific changes in the recent past have made some of these dynamics change a little bit. And what I do here is I compare on the left side the cost of hydrogen projected from electrolysis today if you had cheap electrolyzers at a very large scale, so kind of the gigawatt scale, which we don't have today. So this capital cost of $400 a kilowatt on the left side would really be closer to $1,200 a kilowatt today. But if we project to what that would be if we had large system manufacturing, it would drop to this level based on today's technology. Now today's electrolyzers run almost all the time, so this 97% capacity factor here is here. They use the average cost of electricity at 6.6 .6 cents a kilowatt hour, and they have a reasonable efficiency at 66%, far less than a battery, um, but much better than almost any other route to chemical bonds. Now the competition for this space on the left-hand side is on the right-hand side, and it's abbreviated SMR, and this is steam methane reforming. It's basically taking natural gas and just breaking it apart into hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And what you see is, is that the cost of hydrogen for these large-scale industrial applications today tends to be somewhere between $1.50 and $2 a kilogram. And if you talk about how expensive it would be to make hydrogen from uh, electrolysis, it's almost double that. And that's not really a surprise because the electrons that you're generating on the grid today are largely driven by natural gas in combined cycle plants, which are maybe 60 or 70 percent efficient. If you combine that with an efficiency of the electrolyzer, it's 66 percent efficient. You're talking about 44 percent. 40% efficient hydrogen about, whereas if you just take the methane that you're burning in a, in a power plant and convert it to hydrogen directly, it's about 80%. So this factor of two in cost is really just how the natural gas fits into today's energy system versus how SMR works to create hydrogen today. But the future isn't going to look like today. And if we have things like wind and solar, and we have them in abundance, and we have them cheap, um, you know, so you saw some things about how we project the three cents a kilowatt hour for solar, um, and wind is even le more economic than solar. You can understand how you might get things for some period of time that are at one cent or two cents a kilowatt hour. And even if you only have those parts of the time, and here we've done 40 percent the capacity factor as an illustrative example, you take today's technology and you can see what's happened is, is that you've greatly reduced the cost of the electricity input but you've also increased the capital cost because now you're not running these things all the time. You're only running them 40% of the time. And what you have to worry about is how you actually take out some of these capital and operating costs. And through R&D advances and even sacrificing some of the efficiency. So here, we've basically taken a 10% hit in efficiency down from 66% down to 60% in order to basically show what happens if we can make these systems cheaper. And all the systems today, there's no cost functionality for them because when you look at the cost of the system, the cost of the overall hydrogen is really being driven by the electricity price. Only when you switch this equation do you start wanting to make very cheap systems even at the cost of efficiency. And the reason we think that we can do this and, and get electrolysis hydrogen into the cost competitive region with steam methane reformed hydrogen is because of what's happened in fuel cell vehicles. And over the last decade, through tens of billions of dollars of investment, both federal and um, automotive primarily, we've dropped the cost of fuel cell vehicles from about $30, $300 a kilowatt down to $50 a kilowatt when projected to scale. And if we can do something that's even less aggressive with these electrolysis systems, which are made to act in similar ways, they do the same reactions except in reverse, so the vehicles that are on the road today are made to last for 15 years, turn on and off six times a day. Those kinds of operational dynamics are very suitable for the technologies we're talking about. They just haven't had the effort put into them to get them to the point where they've demonstrated that they can do this, and we don't even know all the hurdles that might be in front of us yet, to be honest. So that's a large part of what the DOE is looking to do within the hydrogen at scale space. I wanted to point out some of the other things that have been going on. I've taken this side from Cindy de Satyapal, who's the um, program manager for the Fuel Cell Technologies Office, where you can look at what's happened in this space. Um, there's been 650 patents that have been, you know, at least partially supported by FCTO funds, and 40% of them have come from the national labs. From a market impact standpoint, that you know, more than 30 technologies have been 
commercialized by private industry, and 75 have potential in the next three to five years. And part of this effort is really reduce costs 60% of the vehicle systems and quadruple their durability, which is how Honda, Toyota, Hyundai all have commercial vehicles today, and other places like GM and Daimler um, and uh, BMW are talking about how they'll have production scale uh, into the thousands of tens of thousands by the 2020 timeframe. So the last thing I want to do in the hydrogen at scale area is basically thank all these other team members. You get an idea of all the different national labs and all the different people who are involved in this area from this slide, but it goes beyond these national lab people now to also include DOE program offices and other industrial stakeholders. And I'm going to skip that slide in the interest of time. So I can talk a little bit about the engineering energy materials networks. So the energy materials networks are um, new within um, the D Department of Energy's ERE program office, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, where they're focused on how we increase the rate of materials development, leading to things like world-class innovation, giving clear points of engagement, and, and allowing rapid scale-up. So basically allowing us to propel clean energy materials development forward at a doubling uh, and a half the cost in terms of rate. So a lot of this has gone to basically bring consortia together and pool national lab assets together in ways where they might have been separate or even competing in the past. And um, the goals are really to get um, world-class materials capability, clear point of engagement, data and tool collaboration framework, basically capturing data, tools, and expertise that they can be shared and leveraged, and then also to give streamlined access. So a lot of this is, is the outreaching part of this and how do we engage the community and, and others in materials discovery efforts. And so the one that I want to talk about is, is most relevant to the hydrogen at scale effort. It's called Hydrogen. Um, and it's advanced water splitting materials. It's really focused on advanced electrolysis, both at low and high temperatures, photoelectrochemical water splitting, and solar thermochemical um, water splitting, and, which includes hybrid thermochemical cycles. There's uh, six labs who are involved in it. NREL is the lead lab, um, and each lab has a different role in it. And really, the the premise of this is, is how do we reach the DOE targets of producing hydrogen at less than $2 per gallon of gasoline equivalent, and a, a gallon of gasoline equivalent, this GGE, is basically a kilogram of hydrogen. And that would basically allow us to do things like put hydrogen at the pump for less than $4 a, kilo, a kilogram or a gallon of gasoline equivalent, and because fuel cell vehicles have t double the efficiency with none of the pollution of um, conventional combustion engines, this means that on a per uh, mile driven basis, um, this is the same kind of fuel cost that you'd expect in these kinds of systems. So just to highlight what some of these things are, I talked a little bit about electrolysis in the water split area. Um, PEM electrolysis or alkaline membrane or alkaline electrolysis are the low temperature technologies. Uh, solid oxide is a high temperature technology that can be integrated with either concentrated solar plants or nuclear plants. And then you have solar thermochemical cycles with concentrated solar power, um, or perhaps nuclear. There's photoelectrochemical, where you take um, solar devices, uh, you have the opportunity to connect them to electrolyzers up here, or you have the ability to basically split the water directly um, out of liquid and then separate the hydrogen and oxygen as they come out. And then there's also these thermochemical cycles, like this hybrid sulfur cycle uh, that's included as well. So I'm going to probably go through the next couple slides very quickly. I just wanted to give an overview of kind of who the people were who were involved. There's technical experts on these from each of the labs. There's data experts. And then there's actually technology transfer experts. Um, most of the patents in this space had actually been in the fuel cell side rather than the hydrogen production side. But it's becoming clearer and clearer that we have a lot of the hydrogen need right now but we also need to have a way to make the hydrogen, and we're not there yet. And so that's where a lot of the upcoming R&D needs are, and also a lot of the IP development's likely to come from as well. And so within the technology transfer activities, there's a number of things that have been done within this consortium type of an approach and within the EMNs. They basically worked out NDA agreements across the landscape, come up with intellectual property management plans, um, 
materials transfer agreements and, and streamlined CRADAs. So all of this has been done in a way to basically allow streamline access and to basically draw this large lab consortium in together and allow them to interact more easily uh, with the outside world. And then there's just a lot more information here on the website. I'd welcome you to go look at it. And I want to say with that, I'll conclude here. I had a couple backup slides, but for any more information on hydrogen or some of the specific research areas, you can look at um, the hydrogen website, uh, which is web address here. Um, and there's a number of different people who are directly involved that are good contacts information. And with that, I'll uh, stop uh, and try to keep us on time. <laughs>